this is a very somber time indeed. Um, and I'm going to dispense with our usual introductions and uh, get right to the order of business. Uh, this past Shabbat, uh, we woke up to learn that at 6 a.m. Saturday morning, Israel time, on the morning of Simchat Torah, Hamas Arab terrorists invaded Israel in a well-planned, orchestrated attack, the likes of which we have not seen in many, many years. We've all seen the we've all seen the images of the savage, brutal attacks on children, the elderly, women, and men, and it's impossible for us to comprehend the extent of the depravity. Prime Minister Netanyahu immediately declared that Israel is at war. Many Israelis are calling this their equivalent to 9/11. As we have from our formation in 1897, ZOA stands resolutely with Israel. We completely support Israel's right, even obligation to defend herself, and we encourage Israeli leadership to use the full force of her military to pursue justice, which must include the complete eradication of Hamas. We hope to bring to you our supporters' regular briefings as this war unfolds. Hopefully you've received our update this morning, in which ZOA announced that our Director of Special Projects, Liz Burney, is organizing a ZOA Coalition Emergency Activism Committee. Please click the link in the email to sign up and we'll list it below for you so that you can get the update now. If you didn't receive the update, send me an email at ajay at zoa.org, visit our website, or call the office at 212-481-1500. I offer apologies on behalf of ZOA National President Mort Klein, who is currently in Budapest, Hungary, addressing an international pro-Israel summit entitled Hungary-Israel Relations and the Prospects of Peace in the Middle East. Mort intended to join us, but Newsmax asked Mort to speak to the war in Israel in this very same time slot, and Mort feels it important to speak the truth about Israel to as many people as possible. I'm sure Mort will be joining us in future briefings. Our guest today, retired Brigadier General Amir Avivi, has been a great friend of ZOA for a long time. He will give a 15 to 20 minute update from his very unique and informed vantage point, after which he has agreed to answer just a few questions. We must be mindful of his time. If you have a question, please post it in the Q&A section of our Zoom screen. And again, we'll be very mindful of the General's time, so please uh, I apologize in advance if we do not get to your question. Here to introduce our guest is ZOA National Board Vice President, Dr. Robert Shillman. Well, I usually start with saying uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, but uh, there's nothing good about mornings, afternoons, or evenings now or in the near future. During his 30 years of service in the IDF, General Amir Avivi held a series of increasingly senior roles, from being the commander of battalions, then brigades, and then entire divisions, where he was responsible for more than 10,000 people. After 30 years of military service, General Avivi founded an independent organization called the Israel Defense and Security Forum, IDSF, and that's when I first made contact with him. IDSF started with just one person with a mission to counter the propaganda of the leftists in Israel, especially those leftists in the military who are more interested in making compromises with Arabs and leftists than in securing the long-term safety and independence of the Jewish state. In the short time since he founded IDSF, General Avivi has been joined by over 10,000 retired senior military leaders who support its mission. It's my honor to introduce General Avivi, who will give us a first-hand account of the war that is now raging in Israel, and he'll speak about what he thinks might happen in the near term. General Avivi. So, Bob, thank you. Thank you very much. and Thank you for your friendship. Uh, I thank uh, Alan and the ZOA. I'm always very, very happy to speak to such a great Zionistic organization, the most Zionistic organization in the U.S. And yes, uh, I can say that the values of IDSF and ZOA are very much aligned. And I'm always happy to engage and uh, talk to the members of ZOA. Uh, I will start with the message that 
the president of Israel, Mr. Herschel, conveyed to the world. He said, since the Holocaust, we hadn't had so many Jews killed in one day. This is how uh, disastrous is what happened. Um, already early in the morning, when we understood the magnitude of uh, the disaster, Israel declared war. We haven't declared war since the Yom Kippur War 50 years ago. And I can say that this war Looking at all the parameters uh, that are going on, it, it is worse than, than the Yom Kippur War. The level of surprise, the failure of the, the intelligence is even bigger than the Yom Kippur War. The amount of uh, civilians and soldiers killed just in two or three days is bigger than the Yom Kippur War. Um, we already surpassed the numbers uh, of killed and injured that we experienced in the Six Day War. And this war is just at the beginning. It's going to be a very long war. Um, at the beginning, um, while the fighting was going on in all 22 uh, towns around the Gaza Strip and in the bases, um, we understood that we need to, to do four main things before we can start an offensive operation. We needed to secure the South. It took us three days. Many, many of the soldiers we sent to fight and try to assist the towns and the civilians were killed and injured. Many of our best uh, top unit soldiers. But I can say that after three days, Israel is secured. The Negev is completely secured from terrorists. We evacuated. Um, all the civilians from the towns. And uh, the IDF is defending uh, along the border. The other thing was that we understood that we need to uh, secure the other borders. We don't want a multi-front war. So we send many troops uh, to the north to secure the northern border. And we send troops to Judea and Samaria and also inside Israel. And we mobilized the biggest amount of soldiers ever in the history of Israel. 300,000 soldiers were mobilized from most of them to the Gaza Strip, four divisions that are on their way to, to the Gaza Strip. Um, I must say that uh, in every unit, whether it's the Air Force, the Navy, the ground forces, intelligence, we have more than 150% attendance. We have too many people. Everybody wants to fight. And then um, we, we will be sending people home. We cannot have 150%. We don't know how to equip so many people, but this is, this is a sign of how devoted and the and, uh, really engaged the Israeli society is. Israeli society is very strong, it's very resilient, and it's now very, very united. We all know what we experienced in the last terrible half a year we had. We put everything behind us and everybody is fighting uh, together. People are standing in the streets with flags. People are sending food. And, and, and assisting every, anywhere they can. They're donating blood. They're assisting the families. And the motivation is very, very high. Uh, although the situation is harsh, I mean, we have 800 people killed, many of them civilians, youngsters. We have 150 hostages, among them kids and youngsters and elders and soldiers. Um, we have thousands of people injured. And, and, and having said that, uh, we are seeing a very, very strong society. Um, today, the army announced we finished the first part, which is securing and defending Israel on all borders. Now, we start the offensive. 
And this is not going to look like anything we saw before. We understand that we need to eliminate Hamas. We understand that we cannot let Hamas ever again be able to build its forces and to do what I said now, we need to maneuver in Gaza and conquer Gaza. And we need to destroy all Hamas uh, capabilities, its leadership, and gain control of Gaza and create freedom of operation to the IDF uh, units. And I think that um, we are having a very interesting opportunity because I can say that we were always really worried that if we deal with a multi-front uh, war, uh, it will be difficult to, to maneuver massively in two arenas. And usually the thought was the main arena will be Lebanon. We'll have to maneuver and destroy Hezbollah. And then in Gaza, we'll, we'll always, only defend and not really uh, conquer Gaza. But now it shifted around. Uh, in the morning, when Hamas started this uh, devastating attack, and I, we understood the magnitude, the first thing I asked myself, how can it be that this is not uh, coordinated with Hezbollah? Why, is, why isn't Hezbollah attacking? And um, I think that uh, we can learn two things from that. One, that Hamas, like Arafat, like Hezbollah at the time, truly believe that he can wage a war against Israel. And the answer will be what we did before. Air Force attacks and another round, and Israel won't maneuver and won't, uh, won't conquer Gaza. And I think that uh, there is a tendency among Arabs always to underestimate uh, our, our, our willingness, our capabilities, um, and once again, a uh, huge miscal miscalculation of Hamas. Um, because you can surprise, and they did surprise us, but what, in a, at a certain moment, the surprise ends, and then what? And then what? But what exactly did they think will happen? And they thought that we won't do much, but we declared war, and we're bringing 300,000 soldiers, and they're going to pay for what they did. And um, I, I, one of the interesting things that is happening is we see Iran wanting to keep Hezbollah intact. We see, on the other hand, Iran willing, in a way, to sacrifice Hamas. Why? And this is a big question. And the answer is because uh, we are moving fast towards building an alliance, an American-Israeli-Sunni alliance that will challenge the Russian, Iranian, uh, Chinese front. Iran sees it as a huge danger to them, and they were willing to, to wage this war through Hamas in order to try and stop this process, and maybe they manage, we don't know. But we have to understand that because this is not only a, a, an Israeli-Palestinian issue, this is a global issue. What Iran and Hamas did is endangering the most basic interests of the USA. And therefore, I know that uh, in ZOA, and rightly so, uh, there is a lot of um, things to say about Biden. But it's interesting to see how supportive Biden is to such an extent that I can say that the level of support we are experiencing in this operation or war in Gaza is unprecedented. It didn't happen in any uh, operation in Gaza before. And it's not because of the good relations between Israel and the US or uh, the friendship. It's because what is happening now is hurting American interests. It's endangering America's national security. And because of that, Biden is willing 
to send warships is willing to, to pose a threat on Iran and Hezbollah. He's sending to Israel everything we need. And this gives us the opportunity because it makes Iran and Hezbollah nervous. They understand that America is involved. We already sent many, many forces to the north. And now we're pretty much secured from all these uh, areas. We can really concentrate on Gaza and destroy Hamas. I don't know if we'll ever have this kind of opportunity. We need to seize it. This is the message IDSF is sending every hour, every day, every minute on all national TV stations. We are interviewing on national TV something like 40 times a day uh, in all the major channels. And, at the, and, the, and the message is very clear. Destroy Hamas and regain control of the Gaza Strip. What will be in the Gaza Strip in the future, we'll see. Um, we stopped electricity. We, we, we don't care if there is a humanitarian crisis. We are going to encourage Palestinians to emigrate and move out of Gaza. Uh, the whole reality in Gaza is going to change. And I think that the main thing is making sure this is the last Gaza war, never again. Never again we can have an enemy on that side that can pose such a threat to Israel. And I hope that what we have been saying for so many years, the disaster of Oslo, the disaster of the disengagement, the lunacy of thinking we can retreat from Judea and Samaria and the Jordan Valley and create a, another Hamas land on the mountains. I really hope that this is a clear message and lesson, a very painful one. Um, for uh, all the Israeli society, that what happened in Gaza cannot happen again. We cannot retreat, we cannot give areas to terror organizations. And at the end of the day, we are going to be square one, going back to 30 years ago, and ask ourselves, why did we need these 30 years of fighting again and again and again, of kicking Jews out of their house for nothing, and this is basically what we'll ask ourselves, and this is what the history will judge. Uh, 30 years of Oslo. And of course, we'll have to really uh, learn why we were so surprised uh, Saturday morning. So I'll stop here because I, I rather really answer the questions and uh, elaborate more through the questions. So Alan, please. First of all, Amir, thank you for that. the briefing. It, it obviously is coming from a place where <clears throat> we don't get to see the information that you do, and it's very helpful to have your eyes um, feeding us this information. I have a lot of questions, but we're going to restrict it to two or three. Uh, you touched on for a minute the, um, the fact that we were caught so, by surprise, and I suppose there's not much that we can say to that at this point, right? We have to just wait and, and see what comes out of an investigation. And but but in follow up to that, Amir, um, can can we be confident that that hole is now plugged? Yeah, I've been interviewing a lot about the issue of intelligence in the last few months, and I, and I said again and again, I saw already the the, the problem with the intelligence also in Judea and Samaria in, in different attacks. We have become very attached to technology. AI, cyber, uh, A200, and we invest a lot in that, and we have invested less and less in a much needed uh, ability that has been going on for thousands of years, human, human intelligence. Uh, if we had good human intelligence, we would have known that if there is going to be an attack. And uh, I think that our enemies are adapting to technology, they understand how to bypass these capabilities, and we need to find a, a new balance between the different kinds uh, of intelligence and learn to rely also more back also on uh, human technology, which was
very much lacking. It's lacking in Yudan Samara and it's also lacking in Gaza. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to ask a question. I'm aggregating questions from the from the uh, attendees of the of the briefing. Um, the the fate of the hostages is weighing heavily on everybody's mind, and um, I'd like you to speak to that for a moment. And ZOA uh, board member Jeffrey Cranes, while you correctly um, uh, acknowledged President Biden sending ships to the area, uh, ZOA board member Jeffrey Cranes asks if uh, Bibi will resist pressure not to destroy Hamas um, in the future and. We couch that with the fact that there are American and other than Israeli hostages. Can you speak to that for a moment? Yes. So the hostages, of course, it's terrible, but we are in a war. In a war, you win the war first. Then you deal with exchanging prisoners and things like that. The fact that there are hostages is not going to affect the plans of the IDF. We are not going to negotiate anything now. We are going to destroy Hamas. And while we are going in Gaza, I hope that we'll manage to maneuver and reach the places where they are and free them inside Gaza without the need to negotiate uh, prisoners. But again, this is not an operation. It's a full-scale war. We are in a completely different situation. I don't know of any pressure coming from the US or Europe or Arab countries for that matter, not to destroy Hamas. I think that everybody wants to destroy Hamas. And I can tell you something interesting. Uh, Dr. Bob mentioned the left-wing generals that we usually really disagree. Um, when it comes to destroying Hamas, everybody agrees. Not for the same reasons. The left-wing generals want to destroy completely Hamas because they want to bring back the Palestinian Authority and, and push for the two-state solution. We want to destroy Hamas because we need to destroy Hamas, but not because we believe in the two-state solution or we think that uh, we should give this area to the Palestinian Authority, which also lands attacks from this area. So also soon, you, if you ask, I remember I did the webinar a few months ago, and, and in the webinar, there was also a Emirati guy. And then the Emirati guy was asked, what is your number one threat? Now everybody was waiting to hear Iran. I was the only one who wasn't waiting for that. I knew what the answer would be. He said, Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, Sunni radicalism is more dangerous to Saudi Arabia or the Emirates than Iran. Iran is the second threat. It's the big threat, but it's not the first one. Hamas is Muslim Brotherhood. It's an enemy of these countries who want to do peace with us. So of course they don't have any problem to see us destroying uh, Hamas. So really, it's up to us. Everything is aligned for us. All the stars are aligned for the destruction of Hamas. I can only say I'm so sorry for the price the people of Israel paid to get this alignment of stars and they do this right thing. So Amir, there are a lot of questions about about uh, Iran and uh, and Hezbollah and Fatah. So I'm going to roll them into one question, and this could be our last question. And then I'll ask uh, ZOA uh, Chief Development Officer Lee Rosenblum to close the program. Um, from our perspective here in the states, it surely looks like this is orchestrated, financed, uh, strategized by Iran. Um, is this an opportunity for Israel to put their foot through the door since Hamas opened it with their evil attack? And does Israel have, to whatever extent you can address this, does Israel have the bandwidth now to address that situation that looms forever? And just to roll it into one, can you also just speak to, you did briefly, you, you mentioned in your comments, Hezbollah, um, 
the PLO relationship, you know, we didn't talk about that. And we have threats from Judea and Samaria. Can you roll everything into one answer and then we'll close? Um, we all remember two and a half years ago, the, the operation in Gaza, when we saw an uprising of Israeli Arabs and Palestinians in the, the Palestinian Authority. Um, it's not what we're seeing now. Israeli Arabs are very quiet. Hamas called the Palestinians in Judea and Samaria to riot. They are not really doing that, not to any significant extent. And I think everybody is afraid. The fact that we immediately declared state of war and mobilized 300,000 soldiers doesn't really motivate anybody to fight against us. And so the situation inside Israel, I think it's very different from what we experienced two and a half years ago. Um, Hezbollah, I think at this stage, with all the forces we have in the north, with full readiness of the Air Force, with $300,000 soldiers drafted, I can, I, I can hardly see Hezbollah intervening and this is a huge opportunity for us, especially when, when, when America is sending warships to the Middle East in front of Lebanon and also to the Gulf. And so um, this is a very unique alignment and we need to understand. Iran is afraid. He's afraid now because America, rightly so, is blaming Iran. Iran has orchestrated, is strategizing, is financing, is equipping Hamas and is responsible for what happened. And I hope that as we are began getting ready to operate in Gaza, I really hope the Mossad is going to take out some of the leaders of Iran. And I really hope that we'll continue uh, the build-up of uh, an alliance in the Middle East and pose a credible military threat on Iran. This is what we need. This is when I'm asked what Israel should ask the U.S. is to stand strong against Iran and pose a credible military threat. We need to destroy Iran's capability to obtain nuclear weapons. This is crucial. And we see when Iran is emboldened and when they get money, what they can do what kind of capabilities they can build. Look what Hamas can do. Hezbollah is much stronger. This is the kind of threat we are uh, facing. It's a huge threat. Right. We need to deal with it. Um, the last thing I want to tell you how I think things will evolve now. Hundreds of thousands of soldiers, uh, getting organized outside of Gaza. When you bring reserve to war, you need to brief them, you need to equip them, you need to train them. You cannot take a reserve guy that may be trained a year ago and send him into Gaza. They need a few days of training, uh, building back the units. It's reserve, it's not a regular uh, unit. So, we need a few days to organize uh, the forces. In these few days, the Air Force and the artillery are going to set this Gazan playground for the ground, ground forces. And the moment everybody will be briefed, trained, equipped, and ready, we launch an attack uh, on Gaza and we wish our soldiers success and um, Really hope that this will go fast and well, and they will conquer Gaza and destroy Hamas. At this point, General, I promised you 30 minutes. I'm going to ask uh, DOA Chief Development Officer Lee Rosenblum to close the program. Thank you very much, Alan, and thank you, uh, General Amir Avivi, for taking the time to enlighten us all on the ground issues uh, facing Israel today. We are solidly behind you. Uh, and the state of Israel. President Jacques Chirac, the former French president, once said that terrorism has become the systematic weapon 
of a war that knows no boundary or seldom has a face. In this instance, it does have a face, the face of extremism. And now we are about to see how that affects us all. If you believe in the senseless expectation of the original Oslo Accords, join us, support us. You believe in the naivete of those who think a two-state solution will bring peace. Join us, support us. If you believe that Jewish students have the right to live in an academic environment that is non-threatening and hostile, join us, support us. Israel is the consummate Jew. If anything happens to Israel, the impact on Jews everywhere will be devastating. We ask that you support us with more. We can do more. We can't do it without your help. Please give generously, give comfortably, but please give. This concludes our briefing today. Please be on the lookout as we will be bringing more briefings in the weeks to come.